Okay, Energy 808, the cutting edge with Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us by Zoom and VoIP and in all manner of things uh, from Hilo. Well, you're not in Hilo, are you, Marco? Where are you? No, my friends and my neighbor. I'm a farther away neighbor right now. I'm in the southern part of the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. Ah, good. Okay. Your voice sounds like you're more distant. What can I say? Anyway, um, let's talk about New Green Deal Part de. Um, and <laughs> we talked about it a little bit last time, but let's flesh it out this time, and let's see what we can, you know, figure out as to how it will affect Hawaii, uh, or its, or the discussion of it will affect Hawaii, because we're not sure the New Green Deal is actually going to be a reality. So, what's in the package? Well, yes. Yeah, so let's kind of start off on the macro, and then we'll kind of burrow our way to a more micro uh, uh, analysis of the the Aloha State. And the Green New Deal is a program, a uh, very ambitious program and plan and strategy, all of the above, that was developed by a number of, uh, shall we say, more green, more progressive leaning activists and elected representatives that took uh, the oath of office in, in uh, Washington uh, early part of January, including uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez mm -hmm. from, uh, from New York and Ed Markey, Senator from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And it is a, it's a very, very ambitious uh, uh, plan to change change the, the way the American economy works. Uh, one, one pundit described it as, quote, a massive program of investments in clean energy, jobs, and infrastructure meant to transform not just the energy sector, but the entire economy. It is meant both to decarbonize the economy and to make it fairer and more just. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is truly a, a plan, strategy, of epic proportions akin to, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, uh, whether you want to go back to uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal in the 1930s, or uh, LBJ's Great Society program uh, from 64 to 68. So it is uh, bold and ambitious and uh, uh, far from incremental, and of course, uh, the devil will be in the details, uh, but uh, the the ask is of uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi to establish what would in effect be a select committee uh, that would specifically be established to come up with uh, a new deal, Green New Deal, and it would be made up of 15 members total uh, from uh, the House. And six of them would be from the minority party, the Republicans, and nine from the Democrats, and they would have a year to come up with something which would take us into some time early uh, early 2020, uh, election year, and then make its way through the House, which is democratically controlled, and then probably be stuck going nowhere in the Republican-controlled uh, U.S. Senate. But the thinking optimistically, if there were to be a Democratic majority in the House, Democratic majority in the Senate starting in January 2021, and a Democrat, uh, a la Jay Inslee or Kamala Harris or someone else who's strongly supportive of this Green New Deal approach, then, then uh, the new president would have a package essentially ready to, or soon ready to submit to uh, Congress. And, uh, you know, it's conceivable that sometime in 2021, uh, the Congress would pass and, and the president would sign a Green New Deal. That's, of course, speaking uh, optimistically. With, uh, we have a long way to go to get there. But uh, well, let me, let me I raise a couple believe. of concerns about it, you know. <clears throat> so, okay, the uh, Democratic House and the, the committee, uh, even though it's a mixed committee, if it comes up with, um, you know, liberal solutions in the New Green Deal recommendations, and, uh, um, and I, I agree with you, it would certainly get stuck in this Congress. It's not going to go anywhere in the Senate. But <clears throat> would that be good or bad for the attempts of the Democrats to win the presidency? Because if it's too left wing, you know, does, you know don't you think that uh, that's going to turn off some some people in the middle, some moderates who who want to see incremental change instead of um, you know uh, dramatic change? 
Well, that's a great question, Jay, and it's critically important. Uh, so you, you posed just the right question, and I, I believe that the time for action, uh, for, for bold action is now, and this is an opportunity to see uh, just what kind of support there is. And uh, I would like to think that given the considerable backlash against this president and against what he represents, what he continues to represent, that uh, assuming that, you know, as we talked about two weeks ago, assuming that this can be packaged in such a way and pitched in such a way that it is, number one, relatively easy to understand, and two, that the bullet points are designed in a, in a legitimate and honest uh, fashion. They're designed to be able to to appeal to those individuals, many of them, um, many voters, who don't have the time and luxury to take a deeper dive, let's say, than, than, uh, as you and I can, mm. and others can. So the packaging is going to be all important. And, of course, the naysayers, which is already a firestorm of gloom and doomers and, and flat earthers, as I'll call them, uh, are, are clobbering this, uh, you know, from one end to the next. And in fact, interestingly, Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell from Kentucky is wanting to put some type of Green New Deal bill before the Senate for a vote sooner rather than later. Why? Because he sees it as political advantage, his political advantage and the Republican Party's political advantage to essentially get the 47 Democrats uh, in the Senate to, I guess, vote on it and, 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 and have that conceivably be an albatross around their neck uh, mm. for the next election cycle. Yeah, so, well, maybe it's fighting, it's fighting fire with backfire, you know? They, they take um, possession of the issue. If they make it a Republican, uh, a Republican initiative in the, in the Senate now or next year, um, maybe they think they can uh, undo the uh, Democratic uh, initiative in the House. Um, and make themselves look good. But, but let me ask you this, though. And it, it, the question always comes to mind. So we're going we're gonna to have this election. We're going to have a, a rambunctious campaign. Uh, we're going to have a lot of people involved. Um, uh, and, and the question is, um, what is, put yourself in Donald Trump's shoes just for a moment. What is he going to say about the New Green Deal in order to, in order to undermine the Democratic initiative? Uh, of course, granted, he's going to try to undermine the individuals who are involved, probably even the Republicans on that select committee. Um, but what is he going to say about the initiative itself in order to try to, you know, pull the wings out of it before, before it ever gets to the election? Well, he's already been talking about it, Jay. He's been saying hyperbolic things. And, of course, what else would you expect from, uh, from a president that is essentially hyperbole is his middle name and exaggeration as well, is that he's painting the picture of, oh, yeah, I'm all in favor of it. I'm all in favor of the Democrats pushing it to the Democrat Party, uh, pushing this bill, uh, and uh, with the idea that, you know, in his mind uh, that, Ocasio-Cortez and others seek to ban all air travel. They seek to outlaw fossil fuels within a short amount of time. They seek uh, entire, these dramatic extremist measures that will destroy our economy, destroy our way of life, destroy, destroy, destroy. So he's, he's taking this cue from the folks uh, at Fox News and other progressive organizations that are taking things out of context, and, and blowing them up to be really super scary things. So that he's already doing it. So, I mean, he's already feeding into the base. That's what he's famous for, right? He's mm -hmm. maintaining his base and gambling, apparently, that he could, he and his forces can uh, achieve re-election not by expanding his base, but by nailing down uh, his base to show up at the polls. Now, that, that was lightning in the bottle in 2016. Uh, I would fully admit that. Many talking heads, uh, right minds, analysts, statisticians, uh, political scientists, and, and the like, you know, thought there's no way this guy was going to work or this guy was going to win. But he was able to nail down his base. And he's thinking, I did it before, I'll do it again. But I don't think that's going to work. Okay, well, I think, I think we got, you know, number one, he's going to make ad hominem attacks against the people on the committee or uh, anyone in the Congress who supports this, as he always does. Um, two is uh, he's... He's going to um, uh, treat it as uh, uh, as dis damaging or destroying the economy. 
Um, his economy that he built so well that he created all by himself, quite remarkable. Um, and thirdly, that, um, that it's a kind of socialism, isn't it? He's going to try to tap into, uh, you know, the attack on Ber Bernie, Bernie Sanders before. Um, and uh, so what you have is those three arguments that I can see. And my question to you, Marco, is with all those three arguments, um, and I don't know what Sanders is, you know, will do if, he's, if he gets any further with his campaign uh, efforts, but those three arguments, will, will uh, Trump get any traction on those arguments among the, the moderates, among the middle? Uh, that people at both sides are trying to bring to their uh, to their position. Um, will 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 it ring true to anybody in the middle? It, it depends on how the the uh, the counter arguments are fashioned. And if you go from the perspective, a very legitimate perspective, that for example, the green economy in terms of energy, green energy, solar and wind, has been a fantastic job producer especially compared to the dirtier forms of the energy economy. They're, and that's indisputable. And that's going to continue. You're going to have fewer and fewer people working in conventional energy the sector of the economy and more and more in the renewable sector. So job creation is not just the talking point. It actually happens to be true. So you have to focus on job creation, prosperity, Clean, in a cleaner environment and and rebut in very strong uh, fashion this notion that it's going to that the Green New Deal is going to somehow destroy our very way of life. Now, you know, Ocasio-Cortez was, was at South by Southwest this past weekend, and, you know, she's one of the glittery rising stars of the Democratic Party for, you know, a number of good reasons. But one of the things she said, and I don't have it right in front of me, but one of the things she said was essentially... Uh, a slam on capitalism, that the capitalism that's being pr practiced in the U.S. right now is, is uh, I forget the, the, the adjective she was using, but is essentially broken. It only benefits a small few rather than the majority of the population. Now, that there is some truth to that, obviously, because wealth disbursement or wealth uh, accumulation at the top undoubtedly has been going up over the decades. I mean, that's indisputable. But when you start going after, start attacking capitalism, uh, it's easy to be pigeonholed by, by one's opponents, by her opponents, as, as being a socialist, a radical socialist. So clearly, you know, that's what Trump and, and uh, Mitch McConnell and others are hoping very much that their strategy is going to be to pin the S label, socialist, on those Democrats who come anywhere close to, to supporting the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. One thing that comes to mind is, wouldn't it be... Wouldn't it be better, Marco, in terms of trying to win the election? I mean, you can do the new Green Deal after the election, um, but to make it a mandate for the election, and this is pretty ambitious, maybe too ambitious. Wouldn't it be a better idea to, to try to hit some major issues that you know, people are, even in the middle, especially in the middle, are concerned about? For example, clean energy, environment, those things, the ones that draw people to the notion of a new Green, green Deal. And leave the other, um, you know, more fringy uh, initiatives out for later, later discussion, in order to avoid um, his attacks, in order to avoid, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the center, the moderates, uh, uh, you know, washing their hands of this. Wouldn't it be better to limit it to energy and environment? Uh, no, I don't agree, Jay, because, I mean, Trump... And, and his supporters are going to attack, 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 regardless of the incremental or more than incremental change that the other side is proposing. And I really do feel that now is the time, if not now, when? Now is the time that uh, rather than going the incremental route, which has been tried uh, on and off for quite a while, uh, has, has left something lacking in terms of progress. So I do happen to believe that, that you know, wh whatever comes at the end of, of this select committee, assuming that Pelosi establishes it and they do, do uh, start down this path, that it's going to be something that is going to be more than just incremental. And uh, I, I think that there's a good chance that that could be a winning, uh, a winning, topic or winning stand for the Democrats uh, 
you know, another kind of interesting to notice uh, or to notice that uh, under Pelosi's uh, speakership from 2007 to 2011, uh, there was uh, a, quote, select committee on energy independence and global warming. But apparently activists and the incoming uh, class of the, the Social Democrats, the Democrats who, who took office a couple months ago, they wanted something much bolder. And God bless them for that, or God bless them for that, because uh, I think something bolder is, is needed more so now than four years ago, especially in light of, uh, you know, record, record uh, worldwide global mean temperatures and extreme weather events. Yeah. I mean, what is it going to take to whop us, truly whop yeah. us? What kind of whop upside the head are we going to need to to act or seek to act more boldly? So I believe it will be a winning issue for well, all I, the I, Democrats who do back. I think, it, I think that depends in large part on whether the millennials, the young people, come forward and vote. Um, because they're the ones who, you know, would tend to support, I think, as far as I know, tend to support um, dramatic change. Uh, and if they come forward, I think it has a better chance. But then, to go back to one thing you said, you said now is the time. And Marco, I totally agree. Now is the time for a one-minute break. Now is the time. <laughs> we'll be right back. Excellent. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Yes, sir, we're back. It's time. Energy 808, the cutting edge. So, you know, the, um, the central part of this is energy. And energy is like, uh, at least to the world, that, that watches us, Hawaii's middle name. Uh, what effect does the, does the, uh, the new energy deal, um, the new clean deal, have on Hawaii? How could Hawaii participate? You know, there are some people in Hawaii who are swearing that they're going to go to the mainland and campaign uh, state in, in various states on their own nickel uh, to support, you know, a, a popular candidate. And I think in large, in large degree, that would be a candidate who is on the, the side of energy and the new Green Deal, of course, which is a blue state. So question, how, how, how does this interact with Hawaii and Hawaii's initiative and aspiration to be a, a clean energy state? Well, I think uh, Hawaii has been ahead of the curve uh, substantially, in my opinion, Jay, over the decades. We had a solar tax credit uh, back then. It was for solar thermal going back to get this 1976 or 74, which, you know, was when I was in high school. So we've, we've, the state has been supporting renewable energy and trying to reduce energy dependence on, on fossil fuels for decades. There was the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, you will recall, 2008 that Connie Lau from HEI, Linda Lingle, and others committed to. So that's going on uh, 11 years ago. So, and uh, David E. Gay and the legislature committing, what was it, 2015 to 100% renewables and power generation by 2045. And I happen to think we stand a good chance of, uh, of beating that deadline by probably a good number of years, assuming we continue a, a rapid deployment. So I, I think we're already ahead of the curve. Uh, and there will be more and more electric vehicles available in the next couple, three years. There was a big auto show in Geneva recently that uh, virtually all the, all the major automakers were there bringing a new vehicles to market. If the Chinese, sooner or later, will be uh, passing through all the various Department of Transportation hoops and introducing uh, their uh, manufactured electric vehicles in the U.S. sooner or later, I think that's inevitable. So that's kind of the, the, the macro brush. Uh, more specifically, 
Yeah, I'm looking at one particular bill right now. Let's you know bring it to the, the real world in a uh, in a timely fashion. Well, I mean, before you do, before you, to... before you do that, Mark, yeah. I, I yeah. just want to I want to make you a uh, want to make you a democratic activist for a moment, and um, I want to um, I want to send you to uh, uh, say uh, Minnesota in order to um, talk to people and try to uh, rouse um, you know voters and votes for a Democratic uh, candidate, uh, and to speak on behalf of Hawaii. What would you say on behalf of Hawaii to try to encourage them um, toward clean energy and a clean New Deal? I'm sorry, are you sending me to Minnesota to make an argument about Hawaii? Yeah, to speak for Hawaii. What can we offer them? Uh, why would they what listen to us? Why in Minnesota? Yeah. Well, we can offer them the experience that we have gained, uh, sometimes rather painful, over the past five to plus years in terms of uh, we lead the state in solar de uh, deployment, both solar, uh, lead the country in solar deployment as far as solar electric and solar thermal on a per capita basis. And our utilities have uh, done pretty mar marvelous and, and exceptional things, cutting edge things to be able to accommodate record amounts of, of uh, renewable energy. So uh, one of the things we can offer those states in, on the mainland that haven't really gone all that far down the, the path that we have is the experience that we've gleaned. And also in terms of battery deployment, uh, uh, what we've learned, uh, things that they can uh, can take uh, guidance from in terms of not making similar mistakes or, or having similar issues. Mm -hmm. Let's go to that bill you were talking about. Um, I'd like to hear about that. We have other issues to cover here today. So Senate Bill 1163 was introduced at the beginning of the session on the Senate side, and it would have done, it would do two things, or I should say the first version would do, would have done two things. It would have started a ramp down of the state's renewable energy investment tax credit, which has been around for decades and has no current sunset date, and it would make a new tax credit uh, available to add for adding storage, energy storage, to existing renewable energy systems, 25% with a cap. And I was um, in favor of that bill because I happen to believe uh, an exponential increase in uh, storage deployment is not only a good idea but an urgent idea. And lo and behold, uh, the Senate Energy Committee and the Senate Ways and Means Committee, the Money Committee, they took out the provision that would add a uh, tax credit for storage. So it was voted on a week or so ago in the Senate. It passed over to the House. Nicole Lowen, Representative Nicole Lowen, will be hearing this bill, scheduled to hear the bill tomorrow in her Energy and Environment Protection Committee. Uh, and uh, I'm sure she's hearing from all kinds of solar advocates and others to uh, not allow this bill to go forward as is. So. I'm, I'm disturbed and I'm kind of shocked that given the fact that we had six, count them, six major storms, including four hurricanes, blast through the Central Pacific last year and scared the, the blank out of some of us, rightly so, that our, some legislators do not feel that a modest tax credit for energy storage is worth it. So is, I'm, is this I'm, a, I'm kind of shocked. Is this a, a financial issue or is somebody actively lobbying on some substantive basis against a, a tax credit for storage? I got to believe, Jay, that it's largely financial, money-based, uh, greater uncertainty about the state's finances. Uh, you know, the, the WAM folks and the Finance Committee folks on the House side, they're typically risk-averse, and, you know, everybody comes to them for more money, more money, more money, and, of course, there's a limited pot. Uh, so the uh, Department of Taxation is probably against having a new tax credit for storage. So, you know, I'm, I'm not dissing their motives necessarily, but I think they're, they're very absurdly misplaced. And I know that's kind of hard, a harsh language, but, I mean, uh, is it going to take a Puerto Rico-like event to clobber one or more islands for us to say, gee, we really do need a heck of a lot more energy storage to make for a more resilient grid? That's, that's what just burns. Well, the answer is maybe so. We're going to need that. Sadly, maybe so. Maybe we'll have to be a Puerto Rico before people get it. Let me, let me go to one last thing. And this goes to a point you made earlier 
about how we had, you know, we had a good chance of meeting the 2045 100% goal for clean energy and maybe even sooner. Uh, but there was a piece in the paper not too long ago um, about the, uh, the growth of renewable energy um, uh, in the period 2017 and 2018, uh, which indicated there was no growth, um, that we, we were still at the same 27% of renewables as, as opposed to all energy. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's a year we should have been increasing. Uh, what happened? Well, uh, a small modification to what you just said, Jay. The uh, Hawaii Electric Companies, as uh, does KIUC, they have to report to the Public Utilities Commission on an annual basis what their renewable percentages were in the previous calendar year. So KIUC has not yet reported that data to the Commission, so I can't comment on what their 2018 figures are because we don't have that yet. But for Hawaiian Electric, which incorporates Helco, Hiko, Miko, the Big Island, Maui proper, Lanai, Molokai, and Oahu, the percentage of renewables in 2017 was 27%. The percentage of renewables for them in 2018 was 27%. That means that for all intents and purposes, it was flat. Now, the big reason for that lack of progress is because Puna Geothermal went offline in early May of last year. Uh, so, you know, I don't blame Helco by any means for PGV going offline. That's Madame Pele's business. But it's kind of striking that the loss of one single renewable energy power plant uh, has a rather significant impact on the entire percentage for all the Hawaiian electric companies. Well, that's a 38 megawatt facility, isn't it? And so if, you know, just right. hypothetically, if you recalculated all that, and you said, yes, 27 last year and 27 this year, but you added back the 38 megawatts from uh, Pune Geothermal Venture, then we would have an increase, no? Because <clears throat> if you add that back, you get more than 27%, right? Yes, yes. And, you know, if PGV had, gone on, had been online, a health care would have gone up from, they were 57% renewable in 2017. They dropped to 43 and change in 2018, and they're saying that if they had PGV online the whole uh, 2018, they would have been 60-plus percent. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's, that's all well and good to say, well, if this, is hap if this had happened, they would be there. But, I mean, that's, that's not what happened. So, I guess, again, my, I was just kind of struck by one single power plant in all of the Hawaiian Electric territory, uh, service territories. One power plant goes out, and they get clobbered in terms of their flats. And I, and I think, you know, on, on the flip side, uh, Kauai, even though we don't have the numbers, but KIUC, for the first time ever, I think we will see that they will have the highest percentage for a single island, mm. the highest percentage of renewables when they do report in 2018. So, uh, you know, I don't want to toot the co-op horn too, too loudly because I don't, I don't have to. But... Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, and things will be better in the next couple of years because Hawaiian Electric is bringing on board multiple large-scale utility uh, renewable energy solar plus storage. But for the time being, for the next 12, 18, 24 months, you know, these power plants take a while permitting and, and uh, getting them online. So there's not going to be a tremendous increase in, in Hawaiian Electric service territories over the next 12 to 18 months would be Marco's prediction. Yeah, and, and, and PGV is coming back online, right? Isn't that the latest news? Uh, that the, the road, well, the access road is open, and uh, they, plan, they plan to come back. Isn't it true? During uh, the earnings call that ORMAT did not too long ago, their CEO stated that they were planning or hoping or thinking the PGV would be back online by 12-31-2019. And if you believe that, uh, I will wager you a meal at any uh, any fine dining establishment on your island. I'll fly over and take you to dinner <laughs> if that's the case, Jake, because I don't believe that is going to happen. <laughs> I was going to ask you for a closing comment, Marco, but I want to leave it right there because I may get a free dinner, and, <laughs> and maybe you will too. Thank you, Marco. Marco Mangelsdorf joining us from... California this time, here on Energy 808, The Cutting Edge. Thank you, Marco. Aloha. I will, I will see you at the Pacific Club, Jay Maitri. Thank you very much. <laughs>